Good evening. I'm Richard Waller, Executive Director of the University Museums at the University of Richmond. Thank you for joining us this evening for our program in conjunction with our exhibition, Janet Hamlin, Sketching Guantanamo, on view in the University Museum's Laura Robbins Gallery. In addition to her exhibition of drawings and sketchbooks in the museum, there is a concurrent exhibition of Hamlin's photographs taken at Guantanamo on view in the International Gallery in the Carol Weinstein International Center. Organized by the University Museums, the exhibition is presented in cooperation with the university's School of Law and several academic departments and programs in the School of Arts and Sciences, including the departments of Journalism, Political Science, History, Rhetoric and Communication Studies, American Studies Program, and International Education. The exhibition and our related programs are made possible with support from the university's Cultural Affairs Committee and the Dean's Office of the School of Arts and Sciences. I would like to thank three faculty colleagues, J.P. Jones from the Law School, Robert Hodiern from the Journalism Department, and Peter Smallwood from the Biology Department for their collaboration in organizing tonight's event and the additional programs that we are presenting or promoting in conjunction with the exhibition. Our thanks also go to the World Affairs Council for their support in promoting tonight's talk. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to ask you to uh, turn off cell phones and tablets. Um, no personal recordings or photographs are allowed during the lecture. Uh, we are videotaping the lecture and we will make it available for viewing on the Uni University Museum's website within the next couple of weeks. Um, so uh, you can, can listen to this talk again. Uh, thank you for your cooperation. Uh, following uh, Brigadier General Martin's lecture and the question and answer session, please join us for the reception and to see the Hamlin exhibition in the Laura Robbins Gallery. We are providing shuttle service this evening for your convenience. It is my pleasure to turn the program over to Professor Jones, who will introduce General Martins. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Welcome. There's more art than science to be found in the conduct of trials. Janet Hamlin's illustrations are graphic dispatches from a theater most of us will never visit. Tonight's speaker, a leading actor of Guantanamo's repertory company, should invoke in your mind the human drama running for so long in such a place, a drama with elements both tragic and absurd. Mark Martins is a brigadier general in the United States Army, a senior and experienced military lawyer serving in the Judge Advocate General's Corps. He comes equipped with impressive academic credentials. He graduated first in his class from the United States Military Academy at West Point, winning a Rhodes Scholarship to study at Oxford, where he earned a degree in philosophy, politics, and economics with first class honors. After Oxford, the Army sent him to the law school at Harvard, where he served on the Law Review and graduated magna cum laude. He is the only military lawyer to graduate first in his class from the Army's Command and General Staff College. As a member of the faculty of the Judge Advocate General School over in Charlottesville, he, he taught military lawyers about intelligence law, the laws of war, and the prosecution of war crimes. General Martins is more than just a master of book learning. He is also a successful and admired soldier. Commissioned as an officer of the infantry, he early won the coveted tab of an army ranger. He also wears the badge of a senior parachutist. I needed to look that up. It means he has parachuted at least 30 times. At least two of those jumps were at night. That he is qualified to act as a jump master for others 
and that he has served in jump status with an airborne unit for at least 24 months. That's, I leave it at that. In Iraq, as a legal advisor to the commander of the 1st Armored Division, he certainly acted against type when he led an 80-vehicle convoy for 200 kilometers from our base in Kuwait to Baghdad. His service also includes tours as a peacekeeper in Kosovo and as a rule of law officer in Afghanistan. He has already been awarded two bronze stars and the Legion of Merit. Tonight, he speaks to us as the chief prosecutor for cases tried to military commissions at Guantanamo Bay. The foremost cases presently underway are those of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and three co-defendants for the attacks of 9-11 and of Abdel Ramin al-Nashiri for his part in the attack on the USS Cole. Let us warmly welcome Brigadier General Martins. should be able to be heard. Can you hear me in the back, Kathleen? Okay, great. Well, thank you, Professor Jones, for that gracious introduction. Uh, Executive Director Waller, thank you for that tour of Janet Hamlin's uh, very impressive exhibit. I seem to know some of those scenes that are depicted. Um, it's just terrific to be here. Having spent a good deal of the last decade in rural parts of uh, Iraq and Afghanistan whenever I come to a true institute of higher learning. And this is a very impressive one, having looked around. I'm, I'm reminded of one of the most fam famous examples of a backwoodsman coming to an institute of higher learning. You know this example. This was Abraham Lincoln with uh, Stephen A. Douglas. It was the Lincoln-Douglas debate that happened at Knox College, Illinois. You know, Lincoln's this self-taught, autodidact, you know, no higher learning at all to speak of. He goes to Knox College, Illinois, in 1858 to debate Stephen A. Douglas. Knox is a, then as now, is a, you know, private, preeminent liberal arts college. Uh, they have erected scaffolding outside the second floor of the old main building at Knox College, it's a junction town, so people have come from all over Illinois to be gathered there to watch this famous debate. The debate, as you may remember, is a pivotal moment in the lead up to the Civil War. It's part of the breakup of the Democrat Party. Lincoln denounces slavery on moral terms for the first time. Pivotal moment. So the plan was that candidates would come out onto this scaffolding through this tiny window on the second floor of the old main building. And, you know, Stephen A. Douglas, prominent politician, by far the more famous man at this time. Lincoln's quite obscure. Douglas has been a national politician for years. He's a compact man. He gets through this window, no problem. Lincoln, you know, squeezes through the window out onto the scaffolding, and he is said to have quipped, at least now I'll be able to say that I've been through college. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to say that I've been through the esteemed University of Virginia after tonight, but at Professor Jones's gracious invitation, I can spend an evening with you here. Uh, and I, uh, Nick, uh, my friend here from um, Infantry Officer Basic Course, I don't think I've seen him in decades. Great to see you again, Nick. Uh, has me remembering uh, my earliest days in the infantry. We were at Infantry Officer Basic Course in 1985 in Fort Benning, Georgia. So um, flashing back to me is a, uh, one of my first field problems with my platoon sergeant, who was this grizzled uh, two-time Vietnam veteran, 82nd Airborne, spent most of his career on jump status in the 82nd. I'm a newly arrived first lieutenant not long after we left Fort Benning, Nick. Um, and we're out under the sky in Fort Irwin, California. National Training Center. After a hard day of training, uh, you know, we go to sleep. I'm, I'm with uh, the sergeant, the platoon sergeant, in the platoon command post. And we've done a hard day of training. And, and he pokes me in the ribs at about, you know, it must be after midnight, one or two in the morning. He says, sir, look up and tell me what you see. And, uh, you know, so I kind of wake up. I look up. 
I see this beautiful Southern California sky, high desert sky, beautiful. So I say, well, I see a heaven full of stars, platoon sergeant. He says, sir, what does that tell you? And I wasn't really sure where he was going with this question. But I, I kind of wanted to impress him with my, my degree. So I said, uh, well, platoon sergeant, astronomically it tells me there are billions of stars and perhaps trillions of planets. Theologically, it tells me that God is great and we are but small and insignificant. Meteorologically, it tells me that we're going to have a great day of training tomorrow. Silence. You know, thinking I had bowled him over with this erudite, thoughtful answer. I said, what does it tell you, platoon sergeant? He says, sir, it tells me that somebody stole our tent. <laughs> that was the last time I set out uh, intentionally to be profound. Um, but you know, the job I'm currently in, one does not have to look very far to uh, encounter profound topics. It is a controversial, deeply important topic, and, and the fact that you're here encourages me quite a bit. Uh, the Military Commissions Act of 2009, what I will attempt to describe to you, is not a drama of uh, tragedy or absurdity. Uh, I take, you know, I, I will respectfully dissent from the professor's uh, no doubt thoughtful view, but that it is a institution completely consonant with our values, with justice under the rule of law, with security in a dangerous time, but in a time where we've got to keep our values. Um, let, me, let me say a couple of things up front. The way in which we went about seeking to prosecute and try individuals following the September 11th attacks was deemed by our Supreme Court to have legal errors embedded within that process. Okay, in 2004, got to, got to face this, got to look at it and see it. The Supreme Court found in the Ham, Hamdi v. Rumsfeld case that if someone is going to be detained under the law of armed conflict, they are to have an individualized opportunity to test the legal and factual basis of that detention. Tom D.B. Rumsfeld, 2004. In 2006, the High Court found that the military commissions process that was ongoing following a November 2001 presidential order lacked the authority to proceed for two reasons. One is that it was not compliant with common Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions, which requires that if you are to try somebody, and punish them under the law of armed conflict, that you must do it in a regularly constituted court, affording all of the judicial guarantees recognized as indispensable by civilized peoples. That's the text of Common Article Three, uh, a treaty provision to which we are party. The court also found that the military commission of Salim Hamdan lacked the authority to proceed because Article 36 of the Uniform Code of Military Justice, which is our code for soldiers and sailors, airmen, marines in our services, military courts, that Article 36, which requires that the procedures used in military commissions under the UCMJ, you could try individuals by a military commission convened under the Uniform Code of Military Justice, that those procedures had to be uniform with military courts insofar as practicable. And there had been no demonstration of impracticability in the trial of Hamdan. And he had been excluded from his voir dire, the selection of the jury, examination and challenge of the jury. So those were two reasons why the Supreme Court held that that process lacked the authority to proceed. And then in 2008, that's 2006, in 2008 the court gave the writ of habeas corpus to detainees at Guantanamo Bay. So they got access to United States Federal District Court to challenge the basis of their detention. 
So those are three important legal landmarks that set the stage first for the Military Commissions Act of 2006, and then a, sl a slightly reformed, and I'll talk a little bit about the reforms, Military Commissions Act of 2009, under which we are currently operating. And no fewer than six legislative enactments, the two Military Commissions Act, there's also a Detainee Treatment Act that figures into this body of law, and several National Defense Authorization Acts have given us a system that in which all three branches of our government have weighed heavily. Now, uh, certainly since the time I've been chief prosecutor, uh, became in 2011. And this process is, I would submit, a mature, accountable, counterterrorism and justice institution. A couple of points up front. First, it's very important to distinguish between detention under the law of armed conflict and trial, trial and punishment of alleged war criminals under the law of armed conflict. Okay, these are two separate legal uh, bodies of law, two separate bodies of law and two separate legal institutions. One is detention. It's taking somebody off of a battlefield. Classically, it's a prisoner of war. Someone who has the authority to fight is carrying arms openly is wearing a uniform or some other distinctive garb to, to distinguish him or herself from the civilian population, is complying with the laws of war, is accountable to a commanding officer who complies with the law of war. Those are the requirements to be a PW if you are captured. But you all, we also have the authority, states also have the authority to detain individuals under the law of armed conflict, to take them off the battlefield. Doesn't mean you're attaching guilt or innocence with regard to a war crime, you're simply detaining them as part of your war effort. Uh, that's one institution, one body of law, and then you have trial of those who are alleged to have violated long-standing law of armed conflict offenses. The reason it's important to distinguish is that you can have serious analytical errors if you, if you blend them, okay? And if you can imagine, a four quadrants. You could, have, you could have somebody who is for the system of law of armed conflict detention we have right now that is supervised by our Article III federal courts through the habeas process. You could be for that kind of detention and against a reformed military commission trial of someone for a war crime. You could be for a trial, a full trial where you put someone on notice and you try them for a crime and against detention you could be for both or against both. You can see those four quadrants. I have found reasonable people around the world in every one of those quadrants. Got to, got to make that distinction. These are different, uh, different entities, and you may feel strongly uh, about each one of those quadrants. Um, also, uh, I mentioned common Article Three of the Geneva Conventions. We are in compliance with and have stated since 2006 that we are expressly in compliance with, see ourselves bound by that common Article III standard with regard to trials of Al-Qaeda and associated forces and those who fall within the jurisdiction of military commissions, that we are going to try individuals by a regularly constituted court affording all the judicial guarantees recognized as indispensable by civilized peoples. We have acknowledged that. That, that was new. Hadn't happened before 2006. We also have, there are two other sources of law. One is Article 75 of Additional Protocol 1. Um, some of you World Affairs Council, Richmond Chapter folks who are uh, familiar with international law may be familiar with uh, the additional protocols to the Geneva Conventions. We are not party to them. But since 2009, we have stated that we are complying with Article 75 of Additional Protocol 1 and all of Additional Protocol 2. These give additional protections to individuals who are being tried. We follow those out of a sense of legal obligation, so-called opinio juris, which is one component of customary international law. You also have state practice, long-standing state practice, plus opinio juris gives you binding customary law. We as a government have stated since 2011 that we are complying with these additional safeguards and that everything we're doing in our military commission system and our detention system is in full compliance with those safeguards. And finally, 
This is a national war crimes court that I'm going to be discussing with you. It's a national court to try individuals for violations of the law of war. There are international courts, right? Some people would say, why don't we do it like Nuremberg? Why don't we have an international coalition? The International Criminal Court, the Rome Statute, again, we are not party to the ICC, but we have been party to international tribunal efforts, International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia in The Hague, International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, et cetera. This, I'm speaking of a national court, which all of our international efforts have recognized continue to be an important way to bring to justice those who carry out crimes with impunity, those who carry out international <coughs> crimes with impunity. The International Criminal Court, the ICTY, the ICTR, all of them acknowledge that nations still may try individuals as long as they are complying with those international norms of having a regularly constituted court. So this is a national court. I speak to international audiences occasionally, want to emphasize this is not for everybody. This is something that is in the arc of the United States' unique history and experience in legal institutions. And it, it, it has long been there, though, though recently reformed. Okay, so military commissions are a criminal trial forum. Tries individuals for violations of the law of war. Had a lot of time spent uh, involving, involved in detention and detention policy. Other people in our government deal with that now. My goal is to try individuals under the law of war. Attach punishment to acts, specific acts that can be proven. The process begins when one of the prosecutors who works with me gets an investigation, gets evidence indicative of the violation of a long-standing law of armed conflict offense. And these are codified. There are 32 of them in the Military Commissions Act. Congress codified them. Attacking civilians, murder of protected persons, use of treacherous warfare, warfare where you're using your adversary's compliance with the law against them to gain an advantage. So long-standing law of armed conflict offenses. We get evidence that uh, indicates an individual committed that. Swear charges, specific charges. I endorse them if they meet the standard of a realistic prospect of success on the merits. I'm a prosecutor in the public prosecution tradition of our country. It's about being an officer of the court, prosecuting zealously, certainly, going after crime and war crimes and impunity, but doing that lawfully with appropriate constraints. It's not about racking up wins or it's, it's about doing justice. We, I have to certify that these charges have a realistic prospect of success on the merits, considering all competent and admissible evidence. I will then endorse those charges and they go to a convening authority. Okay, in the military justice system, a convening authority is a commander. When I was a commander in Afghanistan, I had general court-martial convening authority as an attribute of command. It was part of accomplishing a mission and maintaining the morale, welfare, discipline of an organization so we could accomplish that mission. Get, every, get people home alive and safe and, and do the mission correctly. Um, it's part of command. The convening authority under the Military Commissions Act is a senior officer in the Department of Defense appointed by the secretary for that purpose. And that is their full-time job. The current convening authority is retired Major General Vaughn Airy, who was uh, recently the staff judge advocate to the Commandant of the Marine Corps. So experienced officer, senior officer, serves as the essentially a grand jury function on the charges. Ensures there is probable cause, ensures that the, uh, the accused is the individual who the evidence shows committed the alleged crimes. Ensures the crimes as stated in the charges state offenses under the law. And if those things are true, the convening authority in the military justice system for our soldiers, the commander, <coughs> refers, that's the term, refers the charges to a military commission. Uh, the trial that ensues, at that point a 
um, a judge, the chief judge of the trial judiciary appoints a presiding judge to hear the case. And at that point, the trial that ensues has every protection that is demanded by our values. The accused is presumed innocent. The prosecution must prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. The accused is entitled to specific notice of the charges in a language he or she understands. The right to counsel and choice of counsel and in a capital case, a case in which the commission has been empowered to adjudge the death penalty if appropriate. Uh, counsel, a so-called learned counsel, counsel who have experience in capital cases at government expense. The right to presence, be present at all the proceedings. Protection uh, against self-incrimination, the right against self-incrimination, compulsory self-incrimination, inculp you know, inculpating yourself. Um, protection against the use of any statements obtained as a result of torture or cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment, and the standard for admissibility of any statement of the accused is that it is voluntary under a totality of the circumstances. The right to cross-examine government witnesses, present witnesses on one's own behalf, present evidence, having the compulsory process of the state to gain that evidence and get it in front of the commission. Uh, exculpatory evidence. So I have an obligation to produce in discovery my case to the accused, uh, including those things which tend to show the accused may not have done it or may not have done it as seriously as alleged, so-called Brady v. Maryland evidence. And that includes evidence that would tend to undercut the credibility of government witnesses, so-called Giglio evidence. This is the doctrine in our, in our courts for impeaching evidence of government witnesses. Um, an impartial decision maker. I've spoken of the judge. The judge is not an Article III lifetime tenured judge under Article III of our Constitution, part of the judicial branch. It is an Article I judge. This is a system uh, put together under an enactment of Congress. So these are, these are the same judges who judge our service members. They are typically Army colonels, Air Force colonels, Navy captains, career officers who are lawyers, <coughs> judge advocates who have graduated from an accredited three-year law school, passed the bar in a state, and have now been practicing criminal law with a specialty, and they get special training as military judges in the rules of evidence and rules of procedure. They are an independent crowd, okay? One judge who was uh, presiding over the um, trial of Staff Sergeant Grainer of Abu Ghraib fame was, uh, was told that the Abu Ghraib prison was going to be raised. It was going to be pulled down in Baghdad. Um, and he said, well, you're going you're gonna to compromise these charges. That's a crime scene. You're not going to do that. This was the president was saying we're going to raise Abu Ghraib as a tactical matter. Uh, a lot of independence uh, in these judges. Another example was in 2009. I was with the Detention Policy Task Force, and the president had sought to stay all military commissions proceedings, stop them all for the time being while we could do a policy review. And the judge who was presiding over one of the cases said, we're, we're not going to do that. I'm not going to just stay it. You can, I can dismiss these charges without prejudice, but I'm not going to just simply go on hold. Uh, it's got to be in the interest of justice for me to do that not policy convenience of the executive branch. Another example of a judge just deciding you know, where the duty lay and standing up to the chief executive in that case. So these are, these are independent judges, uh, career officers who are uh, retirement eligible, and they are, they are trying to do the right thing. And, and, and you see that if you watch the proce uh, proceedings. <clears throat> Impartial decision maker pre-trial is that judge. When you get to a trial, it's a jury of officers. So you're in, you're, you have a, a right to an impartial decision maker. The, this, these are officers selected from, to form the pool from the 200,000 active duty officers, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, worldwide, become the pool. The convening authority, that same officer, normally a commander in the military justice system, is 
who's serving that grand jury function on the front end with the charges, also selects the jury pool based on statutory criteria of age, education, training, experience, length of service, and judicial temperament. Picks a pool of suitable officers that have those, have characteristics uh, described by those six attributes. And then, um, then those, are, uh, those candidates are subject to examination and challenge in a sharply adversarial process. I ask questions, defense asks questions to identify anybody who knows something of the, of the accused, has some connection to the charges, may be biased in any way to not follow the law and the instructions of the judge and the evidence wherever it leads with um, excusals or challenges off of the panel to be granted liberally by the judge, that's the standard. When in doubt, get them off the jury, if there be any question as to unfairness or, imp or partiality. And then peremptory challenge. A challenge, as long as you're not violating Batson v. Kentucky or doing it for some invidious purpose to selectively take out a particular racial, ethnic, religious group, you may challenge peremptorily, not give a reason, and, uh, and get somebody off the panel as well. That leaves a panel of, for a capital case, 12, for a non-capital case, uh, no less than five officers who are the jury, the fact finder. This is not a Article VI, an Article VI, or I'm sorry, a Sixth Amendment jury of one's peers wherein the crime shall have been committed. This isn't a, a, a randomly selected jury that you would have in a civilian court, but it is an impartial fact finder. Um, these are, uh, I've, I, there are a couple of data um, sets you can look to to determine what these juries do in terrorism cases, international war crimes and terrorism cases. There's a, a body of about 1,500 cases post-World War II in the uh, European theater of operations. Uh, the conviction rate was about 81%. So they're very capable of acquitting the conviction rate in federal civilian court for terrorism. A bit of apples and oranges, these aren't on all fours, these examples, but it does give you an idea that, that acquittal will happen if the proof beyond a reasonable doubt is not uh, established in federal civilian court in Manhattan, Brooklyn, the, the conviction rate for full jury trials is 91%. So, I mean, very comparable situations uh, with uh, civilian juries. There's skepticism whether military officers can acquit. Um, having been on that, 80, when I was an 82nd uh, Airborne Infantry Lieutenant, having been a juror, uh, they will do their duty and they will hold the government to its burden of proof. Okay, so impartial decision maker. Exclusionary rules of evidence. I mentioned the exclusionary rule with regard to any coerced testimony, but Evidence, the prejudicial effect will uh, substantially outweighs its probative value, normal rules of evidence. If something's going to be uh, unfairly prejudicial, it'll be excluded. Fruit of the poisonous tree doctrine, derivative evidence, things that could give incentives to violate the law in the collection of evidence. We have rule, we have the rules of privilege, certain types of privilege, certainly privilege against self-incrimination, but attorney-client privilege. Other types of things cannot be used. We have rules of evidence, and I'll talk about two exceptions that are important to these, these courts. Um, Self-representation, an accused does not have to accept government appointed counsel, so-called Ferretta v. California doctrine, very similar, it's the same doctrine in, in uh, civilian court. If an accused after a long interview with the judge to ensure they are knowingly, voluntarily, intelligently doing it can represent him or herself, um, however ill-advised that is, right? Uh, but it happens, and, and people have that right to do that. Uh, prevention against ex post facto laws, or right against ex post facto laws, and the right of appeal. First level of appeal is to a civilian military United States Court of Military Commission review. This is an Article I court. These are, again, not lifetime tenured judges, but, but they review for uh, factual error and legal error. The next level of appeal is to the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit in Washington, D.C., D.C. Circuit, and then by petition for writ of certiorari to the United States Supreme Court. So appeal all the way to the Supreme Court. Uh, that is the, the system, and the people in the system 
are intent on making those not just written down on a page, make them real, sharply adversarial system to ensure what we're doing is, is justice. The threat, the menace to which it is directed is a real one. It's one we have to look at clear-eyed and make neither too much nor too little of it. This is not Nazi Germany or Imperial Japan, but it is a, a formidable, shifting, adaptive, mostly, you know, typically non-state actor threat that hides in the shadows of international boundaries and ungoverned terrain, uses off-the-shelf technologies ingeniously to recruit, to organize. It, to ignore it, we do so at our peril. To make too much of it, we do so at our peril, if it, if it comes at the expense of important aspects of our values and our civil liberties. But we've got to see that threat clear-eyed. And this institution is directed to that type of menace. Um, OK, I'm going to warm you up with six types of criticisms. I'll give you kind of the criticism, and I'll come back with sort of the counter, get you, get you warmed up. And we'll get into, the, uh, get into the question and answer. OK. I summarize the criticisms of military commissions with the six uns. The allegation is military commissions are unfair, unsettled, unknown, unbounded, unnecessary, and un-American, even un-American at the end. OK, so unfair. All right, this is that notwithstanding those protections that I outlined, this is a stacked deck. The accused really doesn't have a chance. Um, it's just unfair at the end of the day. The response is those protections that I spoke and them being implemented by individuals who are calling balls and strikes and following the evidence and the law where they lead. Uh, William Shawcross, who is the um, son of, uh, at the time, Sir Hartley Shawcross was the British prosecutor at Nuremberg, uh, became Lord Hartley Shawcross. Uh, William Shawcross, his son, has said that if the, the defendants in the dock at Nuremberg in 1945 were magically transported to Guantanamo, they would be astonished at their rights, privileges, and immunities. Um, and he's right. He's right. Uh, given the way our views of a fair trial have changed since 1945, that's, that's the way it should be. That's what the law says. But it does put a different perspective on this allegation of unfair. Uh, unsettled. This is the allegation that, you know, commissions are new, uh, new, new Rules of law have to be laid down. Everything's a case of first impression. There's a sh it's a shifting body of law. Part of justice, right, means that you've got the law is settled, that you, you can find it and apply it. That's an important value of justice, that it's unsettled. The response is that it's based on a well-established body of law. The core of that law is the Uniform Code of Military Justice of 1950. It's the system. I've been practicing in since I left the infantry and became a judge advocate. It's got well-established rules and processes for selecting a fair jury and trying that case under the law. There are a couple of areas where the Military Commissions Act directs us to look to other sets of rules. One of those is classified information procedures. Because we're dealing with hostilities and cases of conspiratorial conduct, agreements among groups, not, you, you, I, I used to try, I tried some small crime rings and some, some conspiracies of moderate complexity in the, in the military, but this is a more like an international terrorism case with regard to protection of classified information. We are looking to a different body of law, the Classified Information Procedures Act of 1980 to protect all of our sources and methods to ensure that we have open trials, that we have trials in which the accused and his counsel can confront the evidence 
but also protecting genuine sources and methods. So SEPA is one area where we are directed to look to, I mean, classified information procedures is one area where we're directed to look uh, to another source of law in addition to our military justice procedures. Another is in the area of access to witnesses and evidence. Congress specifically stated they were concerned about accused who are in Guantanamo, who may not normally be trusting of an attorney, may not normally want to have a relationship with an attorney, just concerns about representation and access to witnesses and evidence. And so they gave us separate rules that, that ensure that we're uh, making available consultants, witnesses, and evidence, experts for those who may be facing very severe penalties, mitigation experts, and so forth. Um, those, those are really the exceptions. Everything else, we have a body of, of law from which to derive decisions in specific cases. The test of a legal system is not that there are no questions of law, right? I mean, that's what fills the law books. It's a disputes about which law to apply. The test is whether you have a methodical process, an authoritative process, to decide those cases. And we have that all the way to the Supreme Court. So that's the unsettled criticism and the comeback. Unknown, this is the argument, allegation, the concern about tragedy and absurdity and darkness, secrecy. It's all not being seen. The idea that some of us will never be there Ominous, dark justice. Not true. If you have an ID card, go to Fort Meade. You can watch every minute of the proceedings except for narrow situations in which the proceedings can be closed. And those are the identical rules to an international terrorism trial in the United, in the United States federal court. So you can watch every minute of proceedings. You can get same day transcripts of every proceeding, verbatim transcripts, same day, gratis. In a federal civilian court, you usually got to pay or have to be subscribing to PACER or some other service. Um, all the pleadings are online, www.mc.mil. We have observers come. Malcolm's coming next month. We have uh, private advocacy groups that come to Guantanamo and 60 different media organizations, my new best friends. You know, as unqualified as I am to do this, I've got a lot of new media friends to come and cover this regularly, either from Fort Meade or from Guantanamo. It's not dark. It's not invisible. That's a myth. We do close proceedings when there are legitimate, genuine sources of methods it, and, and methods implicated in national security. So if... Uh, if a judge, upon hearing a basis for harm to national security with regard to a source and method, finds on the record in advance that there is an uh, overriding public interest to close some portion of the proceedings, he's got to put that, on, that decision on the record so it can be reviewed, again, all the way up to the Supreme Court. Uh, has to make that as narrow as possible. It's got to tailor it to just the part that needs to be protected. And this isn't always just national security information. It can be private information, right? The, um, the medical records of a victim you know, that aren't re that's not relevant to some aspect of the charges or a defense. So overriding public interest. This is the press enterprise two factors. The, uh, the Supreme Court in 1980 in the Richmond newspapers case, criminal case raising the issue of of the balance of civil liberties and, uh, and security, and also um, the need to conduct uh, processes, criminal processes in the open, uh, criminal justice processes in the open, said that the people of an open society do not demand infallibility of their institutions, but it is difficult for them to accept what they are prohibited from observing. And that's true. That's right. And it's very important to be watching these trials. I'm glad that you're here. We don't mind scrutiny. There are definitely still things that have to be protected and that no state would allow real adversaries to get hold of. It's out there. It really is. And we've got to protect that information. But we've still got to find a way to ensure the accused confronts the charges. Okay, that's, 
unknown for you know, kind of the criticism and the, uh, the objection, the comeback. Um, unnecessary. Pretty fundamental one here. This is why, why have a system. If, if federal courts can try most of these same individuals, right? We're in a situation where something is both, can be both a crime against a federal terrorism law and a violation of the law of war. It's just the nature of the wor world we're in. These are irregular fighters who were civilians. Civilians who were in hostilities, but civilians. Um, the, the, the argument is, well, wait a minute, federal courts have tried these types of individuals. Why do we need this system, particularly when it's controversial? This is a very you know, lengthy debate, appropriate debate to have. You've got to justify. All institutions need to justify themselves to the people and to the law. The, the similarities of the system swamp the differences, but there are some important areas of difference. One is there is a, a slightly broader aperture for the use of hearsay evidence. These are out-of-court statements offered by the party offering them to prove the truth of the matter asserted. So these are out-of-court statements where you can't cross-examine the maker of the statement in court. Important tradition going all the way back to the trial of Sir Walter Raleigh in the Amer Anglo-American tradition of justice that we, we don't like hearsay. We want people to come in, you eyeball them, you, know, you cross-examine them, and you make sure you're getting the truth. Right? It's an important value that we have. Um, there are types of hearsay that are admissible. And the aperture for the admissibility of those in military commissions is slightly broader. So probative, it proves what you're offering. Reliable, it has indicia of reliability. Lawfully obtained, can't have been obtained through torture or illegal conduct. Um, uh, and, and voluntary out-of-court statements where the judge has a hearing over it, an adversarial proceeding, and determines it's in the interest of justice to admit it, will be admissible in a military commission, even in certain circumstances where it wouldn't be in a, in a uh, civilian court. There's this Crawford v. Washington doctrine that's a very strong confrontation doctrine that so, there's certain uh, statements that will come in in a military commission. And the, the, the justification for this under the Military Commissions Act is that these are um, statements that have been, have been obtained from witnesses who are no longer available overseas in ungoverned spaces or spaces where security forces are uneven or undependable, um, that some of that material ought to be getting to that fact finder. We ought to, international criminal courts try and work crimes admit this all of the time when it's probative, reliable, lawfully obtained. Uh, that's one area, and I think it's the right rule, by the way. It makes sense when, when you're dealing with this kind of adversary. Another one is no Miranda. I mentioned statements have to be voluntary, but Nick uh, in Kandahar would not have had as an infantryman to read somebody his Miranda rights so that the statement could be admissible. Again, I think that's the right rule. This can be demagogued, okay? Federal judges, wise, practically, practical and wise federal judges can find ways to admit this evidence despite Miranda. But the rule in the statute is a better rule when you're dealing with this kind of case. My, my two cents, and I think it's, it's, it's correct. Again, it accords with the way in which international crimes have been tried. Other countries don't use the Miranda rule. International criminal courts don't use the Miranda rule. Those are the two major areas. Then you do have that officer jury, um, which I think in some ways could, could, could militate in favor of a military trial. Uh, but I think that can be demagogued too. Civilian juries in Brooklyn and Manhattan and Chicago can do their duty. And it's an important institution of our, of our uh, democracy. And then they need to be, I believe, our, our basic forum. But there is a category of cases relatively narrow category of cases in which the, the best choice is a military court, military commission, reform military commission. And I came to this agnostic in 2011. And I've, I've, I believe there are certain cases. I mean, at the first level, Congress has said we're not bringing anybody from Guantanamo to the United States. I mean, on the first level, if you're gonna have a trial and not just hold individuals, you're gonna do it in a reform military commission. 
but I believe even longer term there's a reason to have this institution. Unbounded, this is the argument that we are undercutting our civilian institutions. That this military court, you know, this ominous secret court is going to be undercutting our normal civilian processes. That's the argument. The comeback is this is a narrow jurisdiction. It has to take place in the context of and associated with hostilities. Hostilities isn't just some throwaway term. It's a real criterion. We are in hostilities right now with Al-Qaeda and associated forces. Often you have some kind of statement from the Congress. It doesn't have to have that. The, the test is it has to be protracted armed violence of a scope, nature, intensity such that the laws of war apply and a state is going to use its military to prosecute its rights, to defend itself. It's not sporadic acts of violence. It's not internal disturbances and tensions. It's got to be armed conflict to even have a military commission. It's got to be limited to those 32 offenses that I said, those long-standing law of armed conflict offenses. My federal court brothers and sisters who are prosecutors, by the way, eight of them work for me because we are a civilian military institution. I, there are eight wonderful counterterrorism prosecutors from National Security Division, Department of Justice, and assistant U.S. attorney's offices around the country who work uh, in, in the prosecution for military commissions. But uh, when they're prosecuting cases in federal court, um, they, you know, they will look at this and have some 3,000 crimes, you know, different types of fraud, different precursor crimes relating to immigration violations and other things that are very valuable and that we have to use. We have to use all of these instruments. But this argument that military commissions are going to undercut the system doesn't pay attention to the very restrictive jurisdiction, to the obligations of the public servants in the system to make sure it's not abused. There's a caricature of a little old lady in Switzerland, right, who sends a check to the Tamil Tigers, a terrorist group, and is prosecuted by military court, hauled in front of this court and prosecuted. Could not happen, okay? Can't happen. There's so many levels on which that just won't happen. Jurisdiction is too limited. The, the prosecutors couldn't bring the case. The public wouldn't let us get away with it because we are a transparent system. Uh, it's just not going to happen. Okay, so that's bounded, uh, unbounded, and, um, and the comeback. The final one is un-American. Um, and I'll come back to, uh, to Lincoln here. Uh, you know, the allegation is this is just not part of our experience. It's just not the way we do it. It's not in our finest traditions. And I would ask you to think back to 1865 now, so seven years later from when Lincoln comes through the window at Knox College. And uh, he's president so just before his second term. He's going to start in January. This is popularized in the movie Lincoln. He's, he's exhausted himself getting the 13th Amendment to the Constitution through the uh, House of Representatives. Um, in March, he is going to give his second inaugural address, you know, one of the most sublime statements that might doesn't equal right in our experience and in our, our republic. These are hallowed, hallowed times in our constitutional democracy. Lincoln is a someone who history has shown was wiser than a lot of the judges of his day, right? Um, he was not someone who didn't second guess military courts. We have data from uh, over a third of the military cases that came to him, either military commissions or military courts martial of deserting soldiers and so forth. He overturned or gave, overruled the, the court, gave substantial clemency. He was very willing to second guess his generals and his military institutions. Lincoln, in February of 1865, approves the military commission conviction of John Yates Bell, who was a guerrilla. He was a Confederate officer operating in upstate New York, attempted to derail a civilian train. Very old war crime, attacking civilians. He's tried. General Dix, if you know Fort Dix, convenes the, court mar the military commission. They try John Yates Bell, convict him of this law of war violation. And it goes, because this is a different system, it used to go up to the president for review. 
Nixon is struggling with this, bracketed by having gotten the 13th of the Amendment to the Constitution through the House and his second inaugural address, he is struggling with and deciding to approve the military commission conviction of John Yates Bell. And he does. So, you know, what does that prove? Well, you know, Lincoln had a controversial record on civil liberties in wartime. You know, it doesn't, doesn't solve that debate. It certainly doesn't resolve the debate of military commissions today. But it does cast a different light on this criticism that military commissions are somehow un-American. They are part of our history. They are an institution and a use of war powers that are in our Constitution when we are no kidding in an armed conflict that every president since George Washington has understood is there. Not everyone's used them, but a lot of them have. Uh, so those are the six uns and the, uh, and the start of some replies. Um, let me go ahead and open it up for questions. Sir. You know, again, I'm, I'm trying individuals. We've got nine individuals currently in the military commissions process. The number is about 150, the publicly available numbers that we can get to you. But I'm not involved in you know, the detention of these individuals. I'm prosecuting them. And I don't have the specific figure, but it's expensive. You know, Guantanamo is a naval station in the Caribbean. Everything's got to be brought in logistically. But it's a couple of million per detainee. I mean, it is expensive. Uh, it also is what the law is. <laughs> and that confronted with that data point over and over again, our Congress has overwhelmingly decided we're not bringing any of those individuals to the United States. So uh, that's the law. Uh, military officers, public servants are intended, are, are, uh, when the law is uh, signed into law by the president and under repetitive judicial review kept in place, uh, that's what we follow. So. We want to give trials to as many of these individuals as we can, and that's what this process is about. Sir. Article 32 investigations are still part of general courts martial in, uh, under the Uniform Code. It's a pretrial investigation. Um, and it has a number of functions. It, it's, the grand jury function, again, is still being done by that convening authority who would get a recommendation from an Article 32 investigating officer. There is no Article 32 investigation process in the uh, military commissions. So. Mm -hmm. The, the process, you still have referral that has to be based on competent admissible evidence. The, because we're, the justification for not having a, a formal Article 32 investigation where you might form it at Fort Bragg or Fort Campbell when a soldier's been accused of something is we're collecting our evidence from raid sites, places overseas, foreign uh, governments are providing some of this information. And that all has to come, essentially, we're doing the investigative component in conjunction with uh, federal law enforcement agencies and the different criminal investigative entities of the Department of Defense. So we, that, that essentially falls to us. We still have to gain the referral of a convening authority. So we have to, we have to get the investigation done. Sometimes it's an investigation that's relatively put together by the FBI. Uh, Sometimes not. So, but the, the um, Article 32 investigation also gives some discovery opportunities to the defense to understand what the case is. We have a very robust discovery regime in commissions to deal with that. Again, you know, in, in the, uh, the college Sheikh Mohammed case and uh, four co-defendants, 
Um, we're up to like 290,000 pages of discovery. Uh, some of that classified, so it's got to go to cleared defense counts. I mean, these were the largest criminal investigations in the history of the United States. So, so I mean, that's another aspect of the Article 32 function that is uh, being dealt with in the military commission system. Right. They are still, they are in a separate chain of command. They go to a chief defense counsel who as of the last national defense authorization is going to be a one star uh, officer. Um, they cannot be um, influenced unduly, nor can I. We're all protected from unlawful influence. What's that? This, on the commission. Yeah, they are, they are in a separate command line, so they can't be evaluated by somebody who's going to hold it against them for being zealous. Okay, so they, it, it's, it's the same division of command that you see in the trial defense service in the UCMJ. Okay, and it, and it has the same statutory protection, sir, that you have under the Uniform Code of unlawful influence. No one can seek to influence somebody to get them to try to back down. And, and actually, if you look at the history of commissions, I think one, you'd be very hard pressed to say these individuals are pulling their punches. <laughs> I mean, they are. And then, and then uh, we have civilian counsel, a lot of civilian practitioners in the system who aren't in the command at all. They're, you know, they're members of the bar. Typically, these are the capitally qualified counsel, those who've done death penalty cases in those cases. Those are good, good points, good ref, uh, refined points. Sir. Well, we've had, you know, some restarts, right? I mean, the, the uh, president sought to bring the cases to New York, some of those cases. Um, the, they, we, many of the individuals detained have been detained for 12 or more years. Uh, and they have access to federal court, and we have federal judges ratifying their detention. So we're in this world where we have individuals who have been deemed hostile, again, in this case, by our Article Three courts, and uh, we're not going to let them go if they're still hostile. Now, some individuals have been cleared for release. We can't get a place to send them that's going to be humane, that's going to properly take care of them. We can't, can't do that either. It's called non refoulement We can't send somebody to a place where they're going to get abused. So it's a tough, tough situation. I'm not sure what you would do, sir. But this is a tough problem set. With regard to commissions, um, we, we have been trying the 9-11-5 since May of 2012 in pretrial hearings. Uh, you know, again, sharply adversarial process. They're raising objections. They're, getting, they're reading a lot of discovery. They have the right to go through that carefully. It's a lot of material. And in the meantime, these individuals are humanely and securely detained. The case of Zacharias Musawi, which was a 9-11 related case in federal district court, took four years from arraignment to trial. Um, so, you know, that's what, these, these cases take a long time. And, you know, one, a criticism could be untimely. This is not timely justice. And at some point, uh, justice delayed is justice denied, right? Um, that said, I mean, we've got a, a case that, it, a situation where these individuals are represented. The delays that are being asked for are ones they're asking for. And in the meantime, society's interests are protected they're being humanely and uh, securely detained. There are worse legal worlds to be in, I would submit, and worlds that are more at odds with our values than that. Um, and uh, we've convicted, since I, since I became chief prosecutor, two mid-level Al-Qaeda officers. Um, and we right now have seven additional individuals uh, arraigned and moving toward trial. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, Ramzi bin al Shabe, Khalid bin Atash, Mustafa al Hasawi. Ali Abdul Aziz Ali, allegedly involved with 9-11. Abdurrahim al-Nashri, the 
alleged bomber of the USS Cole in October of 2000, also in, uh, allegedly involved with the bombing of a French oil tanker in Amakala Harbor, Yemen in 2002. Accused is presumed innocent here. I'm speaking here of, only of allegations. Um, and then Abdul Hadi al Raki, an alleged senior Al Qaeda member who was um, uh, in Afghanistan following 9 11, uh, involved in, alleged to have done a bunch of uh, different attacks. So you can see the charge sheet. And there are several others. But uh, so we have a lot of activity going on uh, with regard to these cases to try to give them full process, but to uh, to hold individuals accountable under the law, but it takes time. That's, that's, that's the nature of our law, uh, and there just aren't shortcuts when you do it that way. Did you mention they started in 2011? 2012 was the 9-11, yep. I'm sorry? Uh, before 2006. So, so they've been, yeah, they all have access to federal courts. I mean, I, you know, I just don't, there isn't a, we, we have no, better system as a government that we can put against this to try to figure out what the right thing to do is. But put yourself in the shoes of a federal judge with somebody who's been held for a decade and yet they want to kill, and I'm not speaking about anybody individual here, but they want to, they want to kill you as soon as they get out. What are you going to do? This is a tough problem. We don't believe in indefinite detention in our country, right? But we're doing it under law and we're trying to and we're trying to, to do it in co uh, consonance with our values. I should also say, you know, this is not a job that the military sought out, okay? I mean, I was heading off to retirement, having commanded in Afghanistan. Now, every day in uniform is an honor, and I'm working with great people, and this is a very worthy mission. And the family members of the fallen, in these attacks deserve every bit of zealousness and every bit of process we can put against this and energy. And so I'm happy to do it. But it is not a mission the military sought out. We will do it professionally. We will recruit every part of our government to do it right in a relentlessly empirical and pragmatic way that's also lawful. But uh, we, all of our institutions are challenged by individuals who attack wearing civilian clothes, right? So, I, you know, I feel the, the angst that you have. I think that's very healthy. Uh, we share it, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's an urging to do better and to do our best uh, in all of this uh, in a very tough situation. Great questions, great questions. Ma'am. Can you clarify, just don't hold this as me and my questions. Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, every, okay, yeah, well, every, sure, sure. Everybody who's in detained has access to federal court to challenge their detention, okay? So if they're, they're now, now, with the exception of some who've been cleared for release and we can't find a government to take them, okay? But everybody else has been found by the process, a federal supervised process, judicially supervised process, they are a combatant. They are belligerent. They, they are hostile. They so remain they hostile. Them, they're, they're this is that point I said at the front. Yeah. You, there's, there's detention under the law of armed conflict. You're detaining someone who's a belligerent, <coughs> right? And then there are those who you're trying for war crimes. And not everybody in Guantanamo is going to become tried for a war crime. Okay. okay? They're hostile. They're warriors. They want to kill you. That's true. They're hostile. They've been found by, a, by the process to be so a belligerent. So you can't let them go home until their case comes to trial because they're hostile. Well, the, the, the authority to hold someone under the law of war lasts till the end of the conflict. Okay, and this is one of the hard problems, right, is when does this conflict end? And then what do you do? What do you do with someone who was a warrior who wanted to, wanted to kill you, and yet now 
you know, the conflict is over. That's the dilemma that we're in. It's, a, it's the other side of this gentleman's dilemma, is what do you do with someone who still wants to kill people, right? Well, you, you let them have habeas corpus. That's what our system decided to do. You let them into federal court. Very important, though, only a fraction of the detainees at Guantanamo can be tried for crimes, okay? That requires that process that I mentioned. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt. I'm trying everybody we can try with competent, admissible evidence. Sometimes you don't have, sometimes you have enough evidence to persuade a federal judge that you have authority to detain. But that's a preponderance of the evidence standard. A judge has to believe it's true based on most of the, you know, most of the evidence points to that. The preponderance of the evidence. I think you got your handle on you got your handle on the tough issue. But this is Well, they, they're hostile. They're not necessarily trying to commit war crimes. They may try to go after purely a military target. They may, they may be willing to operate as a militia or as a organized armed group that follows the law of war. Soldiers try to kill people too. Doesn't mean they're necessarily, they're war criminals, right? So the, when I'm saying they, those individuals who are still detained, again, not the group that we're trying to repatriate, but those who are detained are established as hostile okay. individuals. They, they are taking part in hostilities. They are unprivileged belligerents. And then we are trying to try some of them, ma'am, okay. for crimes. Okay. And then at the end of the day, they will be, if we are successful and prove beyond a reasonable doubt, they will be punished okay. as criminals. Right. They've been, they're trying to kill you too. Okay. But, I mean, this gentleman's question was about that population of people we're trying. Yeah. And again, the, the issue is, you know, we're trying to try them because they are trying. We, we allege, I'm a prosecutor, we allege that we're trying to, uh, allege that they're trying to kill you. Okay? So, well, if you're scratching your head, you should be. It's good. It's good. I mean, it's, this, these are hard issues. Ma'am. We, some of, some of them we've decided that notwithstanding the ability to establish them as hostile, it's in our national interest to have them go somewhere else, you know, to have them repatriated. Some of them have been cleared because they're not, they haven't met the preponderance of the evidence standard as a belligerent through the process. So, we, you know, we have diplomat, we have, uh, a full-time diplomat who works, you know, travels the globe trying to find places who will uh, take these individuals, typically the location where they're citizens, but also some other third countries. I, I can't give you the exact number. Okay, I mean, we can, I can get you whatever public number is there through Professor Jones, perhaps, but uh, I don't have the specific number. Sir. Um, a statute is very important. Yeah, ensure that it has the um, involvement of all the authoritative parts of your government. Um, that that is definitely true now for us, and it's 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 just an important aspect. Yeah, but statute, comprehensive statute that clarifies it, doesn't mean it's not controversial. You know, people you know very troubled by various aspects of the system. The ultimate defense to that is it's lawful and it's in accordance with our values. And you'll have that if you have a statute um, 
the early parts of this, uh, because it was purely executive action, um, what were things that ran, ran it into trouble when it got to the Supreme Court. So I think that would be something. Um, and then I, and we just have to be relentlessly empirical and pragmatic. Uh, open societies and the governments of those societies don't really know at all times what's going to be the threat. And the, the protection of the people demands a, an empirical approach that's bounded by our values. The rule of law is not a luxury. It is essential to legitimacy. But within that space defined by our values and by the law, we have got to be relentlessly empirical and use what's appropriate and not shrink away from it because it doesn't look like something that somebody's familiar with. Um, so those would be some of the, the, the lessons learned. Uh, we're going to be doing this a long time. We've got to do it in a way that's legitimate, that doesn't radicalize people. That's a tough order, tall order, but, but we've got to do it. Uh, and you do that by complying with the law. Ma'am. Mm -hmm. They have been in a process to a preponderance of the evidence. A judge and the military commission has the authority to determine that all over again, and it has the responsibility to ensure that the individual who's currently being tried is an unprivileged belligerent, that we have jurisdiction. Okay, and that has to be done to a beyond a reasonable doubt standard. If someone goes through a military commission, you know, you say, well, wait a minute, you may still be able to hold them as a belligerent. Right? Kind of a catch-22. Well, I can give you a couple of examples. One is Salim Hamdan. Now, he was not acquitted, but he got a, a sentence of about 60 months, and he had served most of that. He's in Yemen, okay? Even though we still had the authority to hold him, he's now in Yemen. Uh, Nor Uthman. Nor Uthman Muhammad. What's that? Is he in jail in Yemen? No. No, he's with his daughters. No, he's, he's free. Um, he's in Yemen. He's in Yemen. Well, he's a Yemeni. He's a Yemeni. Uh, and then, um, what well, I mean, yeah, I mean, what's what, what what's the appropriate approach there? No, I, mean, I don't think, there, uh, I think that's inappropriate. Yeah. Yemen is not a favored place. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, I, I'm yeah, I'm responding to the uh, women's question. Here. The the other another example is Nor Uthman Muhammad, who also served his sentence, and he's in, um, he's in the Sudan. The there is there, these are different authorities to hold. This is that opening point I made about the authority to hold under the law of armed conflict until the end of the conflict, which is still we're still in a state of armed conflict with Al Qaeda and associated forces. So we still have the authority to hold individuals. If someone is acquitted, you have this idea, hey, does that undercut the legitimacy of the trial process? Justice Jackson said, if, you know, if you're going to have a trial, you have to be, accept the consequences of an acquittal. That's what it is, right? We have not had that test yet in military commissions. My experience is that if you have a rigorous process with a jury of officers looking very closely at the evidence and having to be a establish something beyond a reasonable doubt, that if they're looking at the same body or nucleus of operative fact that causes you to believe they're a belligerent, that that's going to get significant deference. And I believe this is what happened in the Hamdan and Nor Uthman cases. You had, you had them say, hey, this is kind of worth 62 months or a period of years. Uh, and then that individual, even though they were still could be found administratively to be a belligerent, is not no longer being held as such. So, but it, it's an excellent question. It comes up, but those are two examples of how we how that's been dealt with, and it nece isn't necessarily a legal authority question. It turned out to be the appropriate thing to do uh, for the security of the country and the institution. I had one over here, sir.
It's a great, you know, it's a good question. I mean, the, you have some groups that speak of, you know, hundreds of terrorism process, uh, prosecutions that have occurred in the federal courts. It's a misleading statistic. I mean, since 9-11, in all of the federal district courts in the country, there are only 15 individuals who would fit within the jurisdiction that I have. So, overseas captures of Al-Qaeda. It's only 15, and these are really of a different order of magnitude than the cases involving thousands of deaths, you know, and so forth, and, and huge discovery burdens and so forth. I, I, believe me, I mean, I'm a fan of federal courts. We have to use every instrument of national power and authority. They're an important institution. I believe they're the, the default forum we ought to be using. Um, but, uh, but that, um, I don't know, you know, first of all, it didn't go faster. Congress put up a bar to it, you know. We're confronted with the ultimate block. It couldn't happen, so it's a, you know, it's kind of a hypothesis contrary to fact. It just didn't happen. So it's just speculation. I do know that we are, you know, we're proceeding and, um, you know, dealing with all these issues in a methodical way. Uh, and in the meantime, these individuals are securely, humanely detained, and that's, that's what we have to be able to do. Sir, over here. Yeah, I'm not aware of empirical studies. I'm familiar with the hypothesis. Um, and, you know, on an intuitive level, I mean, our policy is we're going to close Guantanamo. You know, many, many leaders have said that's the appropriate thing to do. Uh, one of my old mentors, David Petraeus, Stan McChrystal, others have said we ought to close it. Um, but I'm not aware of a, um, a specific body of research it's, it's hard to do because you don't have the counterfactual, right? I mean, it's very hard to do a double-blind controlled study of something like this. Intuitively, I know that it was very important when we didn't have authority to hold someone in Afghanistan as a commander that we don't hold them. That's not a sustainable way to defend the security of your country. You've got to do it for the right reasons. It's got to be based on facts, the first casualty of armed conflict, right? got to find the facts and you have a rigorous process to find out whether you have authority to hold. So, and then you've got to do it humanely. I mean, we are complying with common article three in Guantanamo. Um, if, you got, if you could see the soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines every day who deal with these individuals, you might come away with a different view. Some you know, are going to be, definitely never be swayed from their view that this is wrong, but it's humane detention in armed conflict. For as long as there's been armed conflict, detention has been one of those instruments, instrumentalities of war that seeks to reconcile security and liberty. What, do you, what are the alternatives? You have soldiers executing people because there's no system of detention? It, it doesn't, it's not sustainable. You cannot get your way out of that box. You gotta have detention, and you can't just outsource it. The United States has to do detention. You know, we're not a small country that can say we're out of the detention business. We really have these individuals, so very tough, good question. I don't know the answer. Intuitively, I believe how we conduct ourselves very much has a bearing on conflict termination and on reaching a sustainable, peaceful state. Absolutely personally have, you know, anecdotal evidence, abundant anecdotal evidence. Those L others who are here who've deployed, I would love to compare notes with them. Sir. There's a conventional wisdom that the reason the facility was located in Guantanamo in the first place was because of a perception that what we wanted to do there would not be legal mm -hmm. on U.S. soil. And uh, skipping from that, you can address whether that was originally true or not, but yeah, I was. Mm -hmm. 
Well, you know, the Military Commissions Act does not include the word Guantanamo in it. When Congress passed it, there was a sense of Congress dealing with representation of the accused that did mention Guantanamo. But the, the actual codified provisions don't mention Guantanamo. It doesn't have a sunset clause. There's no geographic delimiter on where commissions could be held. Um, there would be nothing that would prevent it. Um, it would raise other challenges. You'd see different kinds of legal motions, I'm sure, but the, the Congress intended those to be held wherever they can be convened and you, you hold the trial. Um, wasn't present at the uh, decision making. Uh, I can tell you that uh, the Constitution applies in Guantanamo, that all the officers down there have, and service members have sworn to uphold, support and defend the Constitution in all of our duties. Uh, it's not beyond the reach of the law. It's very much uh, now an institution in which uh, the law is being applied. So, um, and you're, I mean, that is in the rationale of the Supreme Court in the Hamdan and Boumediene cases is a concern about that, is a concern about having a place that's beyond the law. And that's just not the case that we have now. Go to, you know, again, I encourage you to go to Fort Meade or pull down those transcripts if you want to read what's going on there. Great questions. Well, maybe I should take one more. This was supposed to go an hour, right? One more? Uh, sir. And I'll, and I'll be available afterward at the, I think we're going to the Laura Robbins Museum and we can talk some more. President Obama said he was going to close Guantanamo. Yes, sir. We've got a presidential election coming up and other politicians are saying the same thing. Well, yeah, I mean, again, if it's bothering the American people, they elect their Congress. I mean, again, it's, it's, that's not what I've seen. I mean, I, we have concerned individuals who self-select to come to these talks, and they are very concerned about Guantanamo uh, doing these talks around the country. <laughs> that is not, it's not a majority, okay? And, and if it were, we might see something different in Congress. The current law is they're not going to be brought to the states. The, co the president is elected not to use you know, executive fiat to do these things. And that's, you know, there's reasons why you want to do this in a, a fashion with the other coordinate branches of government. In Youngstown Sheet and Tube Company v. Sawyer, the Supreme Court noted that the national security powers of the branches are at their highest when they are acting together. And, uh, and so we are where we are. We got to deal with where we are. Um, but that, these are all excellent questions. Let me close with a a quotation from Robert Jackson, who wrote that Youngstown Sheet and Tube Company opinion that I just mentioned. He was the prosecutor, U.S. prosecutor at Nuremberg. And in his, in his opening statement at Nuremberg, he said that four great nations, flushed with victory and stung with injury, stay the hand of vengeance and voluntarily submit their captives to the, the judgment of the law is one of the most significant tributes that power has ever paid to reason. And uh, not a bad passage. I mean, that's in very much what this, this is about. It's about doing justice, not about exacting vengeance. It's about power paying tribute to reason. Thank you.